What comes to mind when you think about energy? Maybe electricity, light, a battery, or something about the fuel that powers a car or the food we eat? The fact is, all of these things are examples of energy. It is everywhere. If there's a fundamental property of our world, it is that energy is everywhere. Another thing that may have come to mind when you thought about energy was this famous equation. To make the point that energy is everywhere, we can start by considering the implications of E equals mc squared. This relationship is often described as meaning that mass and energy are interchangeable, that in some way it is possible to convert energy into mass and vice versa. But this isn't really what it means. To illustrate this, consider the equation x equals y. Is the interpretation of x equals y that x can be converted to y? No, it's that x and y are equal, that x and y are, at some level, different representations of the same thing. Getting back to e equals mc squared, the best way to interpret this equation is that mass is equivalent to energy and energy is equivalent to mass, meaning that, like x equals y, energy and mass are interchangeable at some basic level. Since this is an algebraic relationship, it can be rearranged. By dividing each side by c squared, the equation can be solved for mass. In fact, this is the form it was in in Einstein's original paper. The paper's focus was on understanding properties of mass. What this version of the equation shows is that mass can be expressed as energy, that at some basic level, mass is energy. An object has energy in it by virtue of having mass. This is not the only type of energy an object can have, and because of this, the energy an object has by virtue of it containing mass is sometimes referred to as inertial mass, or rest mass. Thinking in terms of inertial mass is helpful as a learning tool by connecting the concepts of inertia and mass, but once you make this connection, you will realize that it is not accurate. In fact, the term inertial mass is redundant. So rather than thinking in terms of inertial mass, it is better to think of mass and as inertia or mass as an innate property of matter that gives it the capacity to resist change. The reason it's called inertial mass is the fact that an object with mass has inertia. So an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. This tendency of mass to resist change is inertia. So what is change in this context? Change comes from a for force being applied to an object. Any object that has a push or a pull exerted on it by interacting with other objects experiences a force. A plain English definition of a force would be a push or a pull on an object due to an interaction with another object. This is why I said that using the term inertial mass or rest mass is useful, but not accurate. More mass, inertia, and the capacity to resist change are three ways of saying the same thing. This is something we have an intuitive sense of. If a force is applied to an object, in this case a ball being given a push, it will react. If we apply the same force to an object with more mass, it will also react, but less, in this case by moving more slowly. Galileo was the first to provide insights into inertia with a set of experiments about a ball rolling down an inclined plane. His insights can be illustrated with the following thought experiment. Start with a very smooth ball sitting at the top of a very smooth bowl. In fact, assume the surface of the ball and bowl are so smooth that there is no friction. If we let the ball go, it will roll down the side of the bowl to the bottom, picking up speed as it goes. The inertia it has at the bottom of the bowl will carry it past the bottom, up the other side. As it moves up the other side, gravity's pull will slow it down until it stops. What Galileo realized is that with no other forces other than gravity acting on the ball, it will stop on the other side of the bowl at exactly the same height where it started. At that point, gravity's continued pull will cause it to roll back down, starting the cycle again. In a perfectly frictionless world, the ball will continue to roll back and forth forever, reaching the same height each time. Now consider a slightly different shaped container, one where the slope of one side is much shallower than the other. A ball placed in this container would follow the same behavior. As it rolls from side to side, it, reaches, it will reach the same height on each side of the shape, but due to the asymmetry, it will travel further from the center to the right than it does from the center to the left on each pass. By extending this to an extreme case where one side of the bowl is flat, we get a scenario that illustrates inertia. When a ball is released in this scenario, it rolls down to the level frictionless surface and then rolls to the right forever or until it's acted on by another force. This is how Galileo was able to create a thought experiment based on observations 
he made in the real world to demonstrate the existence of inertia. The concept of inertia discovered by Galileo was the basis of Isaac Newton's work on motion and Einstein's discovery that inertia is due to the fact that mass is a form of energy.